Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on combining operational data and ocean source data to optimize voyages. Today, we are sponsored by BS and So for Ocean, who have developed a new service that aims to provide a united digital platform for voyage optimization. We are joined by Smarty Matthew John, uh, Vice President for Digital Solutions from ABS, and Sheik Sundar, uh, Vice President for Sales at So Far Ocean, who together will present this new venture. We have Carl Jeffries, founding editor of Digital Ship, moderating this webinar, and he will also lead the Q&A session that will follow the presentations. So please type your questions in the Q&A box. Okay, I will hand over to Carl now to introduce the topic. Carl? Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is combining ocean source weather data with uh, other operational data and using that to optimize our voyages. So we're going to work out how you can get a better idea about the uh, recommendations for the speed and RPM of the vessel. But this isn't just any weather data. This is something quite special. We're going to hear about weather data sourced from the ocean. So, so far, Ocean has a global network of weather sensors. You can see a couple behind uh, Sheik on the uh, in his screen there. We're collecting 100,000 data points daily and on all five oceans. Now, I don't know yet how we use this data, but I'm guessing we can see if there's a storm coming, what power it is, what direction it is, when it's going to hit us. And that's more useful to a ship in the middle of the ocean than the weather forecast that might be made in uh, thousands of miles away. Now, you probably think you understand maritime weather forecasts. So it's not that long ago, maritime weather forecast was pretty much the same as a weather forecast we see on the television. It says this is the weather over the next few days in different places, but... Uh, there's more and more to it. So we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago. We looked at historical weather data. So that's a completely different thing to weather forecasts. But now we're looking at a, another completely different thing, which is live weather data. So the uh, the quest for us today is to show you how live weather data is going to be really useful with these operations. And I, I just found out that these that these devices are often put in the sea by ships themselves, by customers. They, they don't actually uh, have any power themselves. They just float around. But having thousands of them gives them a let's just pick up a really global picture. So we've got two speakers today. Smarty Matthew John is the Vice President of Digital Solutions with the American Bureau of Shipping. He's based in KT, which is just outside Houston. And he's been in with ABS in various roles since 2008. Then we're gonna hear from Shik Sundar. He's a Vice President of Sales with So Far Ocean. He's based in San Francisco and he's been working in a number of different technology companies for a few decades. He's Two companies have been working together since November 2021, and they've already got a couple of customers that are piloting the solution, and they're going to be fully integrated in a couple of months. So first, we're going to hear from Smarty about how to use a platform for decarbonization. Then we're going to hear more from Shik Sundar about how the weather boys work. Weather boys work. So I'd like to invite Smarty to give his talk. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again, Carl. And then thank you, everyone, for uh, joining our presentation here. Let me just uh, share the screen real quick here. We have a few slides as always, just to kind of ground the conversation here. Um, but very excited to talk to you about the partnership that we have with So Far Ocean and how we have been actually helping our clients in our digitalization and decarbonization for the industry. So very quickly in terms of the agenda and our plan is to kind of keep this fairly informal. So Vishik and I will be kind of tag teaming here and going through a few slides. And we want to leave a good portion of time for conversation, you know, questions and clarifications, because there's a lot of discussion around this topic right now, which is very timely. So we want to definitely leave some, some time for conversations and discussions around the topic. So kind of starting off with just why is voyage optimization really important in this industry at this time? And as everybody appreciates, there's a lot of conversations around route optimization and voyage optimization. And what is the difference between the two? There's a lot of providers in the space as well. And, and why does what we are doing together here make a tangible difference in the industry? And how are we going to solve some of the pain points? And where have we seen the ROI? So that's really the value conversation. We'll get into a little bit more of the, the secret behind the magic in terms of us talking a bit more around how the so far ocean uh, buoys work and how the route optimization works there. We'll talk a bit about ABS, My Digital Fleet, and how the platform ties everything together. 
for a connected experience, both on board the vessels as well as on the shore side, working hand in hand to help with this uh, journey. And then, you know, we'll leave it open for some questions here. Uh, with that, I guess we have had the introductions, but let's let's talk about voyage optimization a little bit. So everybody who's joined here, I'm sure in the industry, whether you are a ship owner, you are a ship manager, operator, or a charterer, I'm sure that all of you have on your radar decarbonization as one of the top priorities, as well as the ESG journey and reporting of those metrics, whether it's driven by regulations or driven by any market-based measures that you may be following. This is, this is top of mind for everyone in the industry, and, and we are very aware of that. And something that we have been looking into and working very closely with the industry with. So from ABS setting up our sustainability centers globally, tracking and monitoring alternate fuels, operational efficiency gains, as well as various ways in which we can support the ESG journey of our clients to more of digital solutions and capabilities that are required to make this really practical and tangible. Decarbonization is, is an industry-wide problem that needs not just one company or two companies. It, it requires a, a large amount of stakeholders to really lean in and, and come up with some innovative solutions to actually meet those ambitious goals of 2030 and 2050, or even getting to that net zero target that we aim. So the way that you know, I would like to kind of make the case for decarbonization is like everything else that we have experienced even in the digitalization sense, it is a journey that can be looked at, at in different stages or phases. So you have different ways of approaching this problem you know, in a more practical way, starting up with the real short-term solution. Like what do we do today in order to address this? What do we do more in the midterm in order to address this and what's our long-term solution that's gonna help this. And, and there is a range, a broad spectrum of things that need to be considered as you go through these different stages. So let's start with really the near-term focus. So the near-term or the short-term focus is really looking through that EXI filter. You're having some of your vessels that meet those requirements and you're passing through to the other side. And now your goal is how do you continuously monitor your vessel, its voyages, its operations, and come up with smart ways in order to reduce your carbon footprint. That's number one. And that's where the whole voyage optimization play comes in, is this is where you can actually take your existing fleet today, do real evaluation of the number of factors that, that come into play. And it's a very, um, let's say there's a lot of things that need to be balanced out in terms of regulatory requirements, in terms of commercial requirements, some of the operational things that, that are really closely tied to it. So there are a number of factors that need to be correlated and, and optimized in a way that you can get the best results in terms of route, in terms of an RPM or speed that can be used to get the maximum advantage of fuel savings and carbon footprint reduction, right? And, and this is really, um, really good for the industry, both from a safety standpoint, in terms of making sure that your vessels are going through the route that has better situational awareness, lower amount of navigational hazards. It's important from an environment standpoint, the lower your fuel uh, consumption goes, the more is your carbon footprint reduction, your greener. And ultimately, there is also the profitability side that you have certain commercial constraints, whether it's a required time of arrival, whether it is certain charter party requirements of consumption and speed that you have to maintain. And you need to have a fine balancing act of all of these capabilities and factors with in relation to your vessel's active condition in terms of vessel performance to be able to come up with an optimal solution that, that's right for your vessel. It's very much about your vessel, your trade route, that, that may be very different from something else that you have. And again, you need to be able to tie these all together, not just at a vessel level, but at a fleet level to really understand how does this impact your business strategy and your path forward from a decarbonization standpoint? What is your CII going to look like here to date? As well as what would you forecast this from an outlook standpoint for the near term to see if your vessels are actually going to be able to cross that threshold that's required to be 
to be satisfying those regulatory and, and market measures? And if not, at what point of time do you have to consider transitioning your fleet into more um, interim fuels, let's say LNG or others, that may be coming into play in, in between, where you still need the monitoring, you still need the optimization, but you have an interim solution for at least some vessels from your fleet. And, and this is an active decision-making that we as ABS discuss with a lot of our clients today, making those critical decisions regarding their new construction and new bills that are being proposed in the arts right now. And then it comes into the longer term solution. Are we looking at biofuel, ammonia? Are we looking at uh, nuclear and, and so many other different options that are being considered now and being evaluated by the industry with a lot of rigor to see what would be that fuel of the future that's gonna be helping us get towards our end state and, um, and what's the infrastructure that's needed around it and the standardization needed around it to be able to scale this truly in a form that the entire industry can embrace and accept this. But in the interim, as we said, the short-term and interim plan is really where a lot of our industry's needs are today. And, and this is truly where so far Ocean and ABS has been focused on is this voyage optimization piece. And, and how do we actually support the industry through a level of optimization in terms of the right route, the right speed, to get to you the maximum savings again. And, and weather being a critical factor in this, because that's one of the areas where there is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of dynamics around that, which really comes into play. And I'll let Sheik, if you want to add anything more on what the nuances around weather is and why that makes a huge difference in voyage optimization. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Um, that was very eloquently stated. I would add just a few things. So. The, the graphic on the left side of the slide here, um, it, we didn't make that up. That, those are all IMO statistics. These are numbers that come from an IMO report and we've got a link to the report on the slide. But the thing that's really interesting here is it shows a number of tactics and strategies for reducing emissions um, over the long haul for the industry. Um, and Voyage optimization plus speed optimization have the opportunity to reduce emissions by up to 85%. You know, that's, that seems like a lot and it is a lot. I think there's probably some, some bias there towards extreme slow steaming um, that, that they've factored in in order, to achieve, in order to come up with that 85% number. But the thing that's really cool is these two combined do have tremendous um, opportunity for reductions, and they are also um, just OPEX. They don't require CAPEX. So all of the other tactics and strategies that you see on this slide require pretty significant CAPEX. Um, a lot of them are still in what I call the R&D phase where they're being tested at a very small scale, um, and the industry is, you know, still coming up with the general consensus of which direction they want to move in. And so uh, as Smarty indicated, in this interim period, um, voyage and speed optimizations are an easy win, um, low investment, high return, um, and a great way to you know, move forward in, in both the emissions reduction, the fuel consumption reduction, and they're going to have compounding effects um, as some of these other CapEx heavy technologies get adopted. So if you're talking about, you know, alternative propulsion like wind and um, kites uh, and sails, um, those types of technologies um, have pretty tremendous uh, emissions reductions capabilities and fuel consumption reduction capabilities, but they also rely even more heavily on more accurate weather forecasts in, in order to optimize routes while still hitting business constraints such as required time of arrival. So that's the only thing I would add. Yeah, thanks, Sheik. Now, how, how does this all kind of work together? And let's start from the shore side, from a voyage optimization perspective. I mentioned about a lot of the different factors that you need to take into account. So the experience, as you can imagine, for uh, a totally connected experience for both the shore side and the onboard 
is sort of going through this flow, which is what we kind of wanted to use to kind of set the foundation for how this all works. So you have your optimization parameters, whether it's the bunker cost, it's your TCE or time charter index, it's your charter party requirements in terms of speed and consumption, and, and some constraints around your required time of arrival, which is you know, sometimes a shorter window, sometimes a bigger window, depending on the segment of market you're in, flows into the Wayfinder application. And that entry point is, is being made through my digital fleet, which is what primarily the shoreside team uses. And, and the commercial teams think of a voyage manager and, and a number of shoreside superintendents are entering that information in. And then that goes into so far Wayfinder. And Sheik, if you want to kind of cover the route as it as it goes through so far ocean, and then I'll get back in when we get to my digital fleet then. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a it's a seamless handoff. The two products are integrated. Um, we're in testing right now with pilot customers. Um, and um, there's a seamless handoff there. And in real time, as any of those components get updated, those business constraints get updated within Wayfinder. Wayfinder takes those business constraints. We are combining it with a vessel performance model, which is specific to your, your ships um, and the best weather data, which comes from the SOFAR network um, to reduce uncertainty of the voyage. And then in real time, provide dynamic optimization for the master as well as the crew um, so that they can make the best decisions about um, their route and their speed and RPM guidance. Um, right now, the way the workflow works is that, that routing advice and guidance um, flows to the captains as well as the shoreside team. Um, depending on the fleet dynamics, sometimes there's a collaborative decision Sometimes the captain makes the decision. Sometimes the shoreside team makes the decision. But the captain has all the information um, running through the Wayfinder app on the bridge computer, along with uh, email support for the times when they have um, intermittent connectivity at sea. And once they've evaluated that route guidance, and if they've accepted a new route with some you know, specific savings or uh, additional safety measures, um, that then flows back through Wayfinder and into the My Digital Fleet system. And, and that's where they get to see a continuous monitoring of the voyage status, the savings, both in terms of fuel, as well as in terms of the carbon footprint reduction. This is all being related to your overall environmental or sustainability targets or KPIs that you've set. So you can see this in, in real time, both at a vessel level, as well as at a fleet level, and, and both in terms of whether it's a monthly, quarterly, or yearly targets that you've set for yourself, you'll be able to compare and, and bring all of this together so that you know actively where your vessel and fleet sat against those targets. And what is the impact of those adjustments that you're making to those uh, market drivers or optimization parameters? And when you make those changes, how is it impacting your overall decarbonization trajectory? that can be seen again in real time, which is a very powerful thing to see because it's very important that the smaller decisions that we are making on a day-to-day -day basis, how does that really impact your overall strategy towards decarbonization, which is one of the things that there is a lot of value in being able to see that thread of how the operations can really impact your, your overall um, trajectory for, for the near term, as well as more for the long-term uh, components there. And the overall experience based on the pilots uh, or that we have done with clients actively now has been very well uh, received. And the fact that, again, she can talk to more of this when he gets to a slide of being able to be on board the vessel and in a connected experience going into Wayfinder, actually clicking on the buoys around the vessel and, and being seeing that live feed of information on the weather conditions, that's really a powerful experience, giving kind of a reassurance that the route that's been provided, the decisions that they're being made ultimately by the, the master and the captain on board is the best decision, both from a safety standpoint, uh, as, as well as from an overall reduction standpoint. So those definitely make a huge difference, as well as communicating that same unified view through my digital fleet to the shoreside team so that everybody can have a productive discussion. And this is not just 
within a ship operator or owner, but this can be across the board with multiple stakeholders. If you have charters with their charter party requirements, as well as operators, owners, who have to have those conversations regarding certain deviations or exceptions that may happen during the voyage, for very specific reasons, you would be able to see those indications and get reports out of it so that that conversation is very much founded in a very data informed way towards why things were done and then what specifically led to certain decisions at any given point of time during the voyage. So in, in a nutshell, what's the overall value proposition and, and how did we come up with this partnership? So as ABS was thinking about going down the route of voyage optimization being a key pillar within the decarbonization journey of our clients and a core capability that we really wanted to bring into my digital fleet. Our approach as ABS and as my digital fleet has always been to look out for opportunities to work collaboratively with the industry to see where are the capabilities within certain startup scale-ups that have brought in something very niche to the industry that could truly make a difference. Because again, like I want to emphasize, there's a lot of providers out there that work on voyage optimization as, as, a, as a problem. And, and we need to bring something to the table that really differentiates ourselves from the rest of the market in order to be truly able to propose a solution that makes a difference today. And that can really convert into an ROI that's proven. And that's where we went through an evaluation process. Let's say a lot of proof of concepts were done. We did a number of different discussions. And, and what we thought was really unique is, is the so far ocean capabilities that I'll let she kind of expand on here a little bit more. Thanks, Marty. So I think that so far takes a unique approach to this voyage optimization challenge. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper on this in the next few slides. But, you know, our, our really key differentiators are one, we are the only company in the world um, that's doing this and has infrastructure in the ocean to collect data ourselves. And, you know, these, these spotters, buoys behind my shoulders here um, give you an idea of, of what they look like. And so the other things that I think um, really take advantage of that real-time data element are um, the fact that we do continuous optimization. So we don't just give a single optimization at the outset of the voyage during the voyage planning stage. We are looking for the mathematical best optimum, lowest cost, safest route every six hours. And then we promote that to both the captain as well as um, shoreside teams on a schedule that they prefer. Most of them want it at 9 a.m. local vessel time. And then finally, and I'll go much deeper into this, uh, on the seakeeping side, we collect a number of unique wave parameters um, that no one else has in the industry or in the world that allow us to provide um, wholly unique and very, very accurate seakeeping guidance, which is increasingly important given that the oceans are becoming more energetic with climate change. And you know, when, when we thought about go-to-market, um, we looked at a lot of potential partners as well. And for us, we were incredibly excited to partner with ABS, given that you know one of the largest classification societies in the industry have a incredible reputation um, for integrity, as well as for always being on the forefront of adopting new technologies and promoting new technologies that they believe are going to move the industry forward um, and make it more progressive. So yeah, thrilled to be on this webinar with you today, Smarty. Same here, Sheikh. And, and the integrated voyage intelligence that's combining the capabilities of so far with the core capabilities of my digital fleet that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Again, with a lot of partnership with uh, equally forward thinking clients, what we have been able to do really there is to be able to come up with a solution that can actually bring together a lot of the different pieces of the equation, whether it's looking at structural, environmental, machinery, and, and the commercial aspects all together into one view so that decisions can be made very effectively. And again, we kind of highlight and we'll go into a bit more detail of this real time insights to achieve the compliance goals as well as to achieve some of those decarbonization targets that you may have set uh, for yourself.
And with that, so far, we'll get kind of get into a little bit of detail on, on each of these here with the sheet covering this part. All right. Thank you very much, Smarty. So um, it all starts with, with this spotter buoy that you see on the slide. And I've got two of them behind me here. Let me grab one. So spotter buoy is a med ocean buoy, slightly larger than basketball, as you can see. Um, it's got solar panels, carries a sensor payload, um, and has a satellite modem um, to commu communicate with the world. Um, spotter buoy is, is continuously sampling the ocean conditions, and it reports the ocean conditions on an hourly basis to our cloud infrastructure. Um, we then capture that, and we assimilate it into a forecast model. This is really, really powerful. I, I, I want to state a few things. One, this is a core innovation. We own the technology. Um, we've built this IP. And um, we are a full stack company that engineers these devices, um, has built a data infrastructure to make sense of the data it collects, as well as building applications like Wayfinder, um, which is specific to the voyage optimization problem. And so, uh, a couple of things that are really unique about the buoy. One, it's collecting wave parameters. Two, it's collecting wind. Um, it's cl collecting sea surface temperature, barometric pressure. Um, it has a microphone for uh, understanding if it's raining or not, very important, uh, as well as uh, drift patterns. So these are, are free floating. Um, with regard to all of those parameters, we typically see that 60% of the resistance of the vessel comes from waves, 20% is wind, and 20% is current. So, and, and that changes based on where you are in the world and what type of a, a trade route you're running. But in general, that tends to be the resistance function um, to the hull of the vessel. In terms of the waves, one of the most important things is understanding actually the full spectral profile of the waves. And that is something that we uniquely collect there's no one else in the world that's able to do that currently. Um, even, even governments, they do it locally, usually on the coastlines, but there's no one that's collecting this in the open ocean. Next. Yeah, and, and these, these are the big differences that impact when you talk about voyage optimization and, and how weather plays a little critical role, getting that high fidelity data more than even the satellite, which is a supplement to this, really makes a difference. Yeah. Absolutely, that's right. So um, in, in addition to collecting observations in situ, actually on the surface of the ocean, we, we use best in class satellite data from the two government centers in, in the US and Europe. We combine all of that data using the best in class open source models. And essentially we're using the observations from the spotter buoys to constrain the now state of the model. So if we know that in the Southern Ocean that um, the spotter buoys are reporting five meter waves, and yet the forecast model is saying that the waves are three meters, we would then correct that forecast model to make it five meters at that specific point. And then we, we propagate that wave spectrum forward in both space and time. So we're able to get improvements in the model forecast in areas where we don't have coverage. So that's, that's really, really important. That's, that's kind of the key secret to the way our system works. Um, we're running an operational forecast that's uh, generated every six hours, synchronized with NOAA in the US and ECMWF in Europe. And you can see on the left-hand side, a graphic of our network. We have over 700 spotters in the open ocean, which you can see there. We have thousands more along the coasts, which are not displayed um, on this map. And then within the next six to 12 months, I would say, depending on uh, supply chain, global supply chain, we hope to be at around 2000 spotters uh, of varying density um, across all oceans, but we're already seeing pretty massive improvements um, with our existing network. So depending on um, 
depending on the energy in the ocean, we're seeing anywhere from a 20 to 50% um, improvement in the accuracy of our forecasts over best in class models. And what's really exciting, I think, for the shipping industry specifically is our forecasts tend to get more accurate when there's more energy in the ocean. So when the waves are bigger, when the currents are stronger, and when the winds are blowing harder, you know, these higher Beaufort sea states, that's when our model and our forecast gets even better because we're, we're offering bigger corrections um, with our, with our real-time observations um, to, to these forecasts. And, you know, we've seen that translate on average into around 3% on the voyage gains, which is a combination of both time and fuel savings. And uh, in the top right, you know, we've got a, a few of the customers that um, have, have been very early adopters and supporters of us since the very beginning when, you know, we, we had very few sensors in the water, primarily just in the Pacific. Um, and, you know, some, some premier um, bulk and, and tanker customers across a variety of sizes, as well as DARPA. So if you're not familiar with DARPA, DARPA um, is, is a large United States intelligence agency. Um, they've been one of the biggest sponsors of this program because this data is incredibly valuable to the defense and intelligence interests of the United States, um, especially in, in the Pacific. Yeah, and uh, to add there, Sheik, you know, our pilots with some of the new container lines that we have been working with have also brought in a number of different uh, constraints and factors that really optimize the voyage based on different very specific niche factors that are really important to them given their uh, type of operations. And we are seeing similar gains there too, which is really, which is really uh, good to see as a good ROI that goes yeah. in. Absolutely. Point out, we've got 19 really good questions. So it'd be great to have plenty of time to go through them. I don't know how much more material you've got. But <laughs> yeah, we'll try to run through this in the next uh, five minutes or so, and then we'll leave the rest for all the okay. questions. Glad to hear the engagement there. Yeah. So uh, just quickly, Wayfinder, how does it work? We're taking the best in class weather data, which I've already uh, described, which is a combination of our distributed sensors assimilated into a global forecast model. We build a vessel specific performance model. So we take all of the vessel parameters. We start with a physics-based model, right? Um, using those vessel parameters. We then augment that with as much data as we can get. Usually we request two years of noon report data. If you have high frequency data, we'd love to get that. Um, and so we use that to, to better calibrate what the consumption curves look like for that vessel, the speed, power, consumption curves in different sea states. So we have that. And then we look at the market conditions. And so those market conditions are typically entered by the operator in this partnership with ABS. We're pulling those directly from the ABS My Digital Fleet system in real time. So the charter rates, bunker prices, schedules, all of those things that can, you know, change very quickly, both at a ship level as well as at a fleet level. And then all of that is combined to produce the Wayfinder optimization engine. You can see on the right here of this slide, we have the captain's interface. It has, uh, just like Google Maps, what it does it's, is it's always looking for a savings opportunity. And when it finds a saving op savings opportunity, it promotes that to both the captain, as well as the shoreside team. And you can see in the interface there that it actually calculates what those voyage gains look like. Um, and the voyage gains are typically, in this case, it looks like a, a bulk carrier route going um, laden from Brazil to China, um, a combination of you know, the charter rate savings and the fuel savings in this case. And that's combined to provide some total voyage gains. Um, what's really important here is, is this is proactive and dynamic. So the shoreside team doesn't have to worry about it. The, the captain doesn't have to worry about it. The captain can focus on operating the vessel and the safety of the crew and cargo. The shoreside team can focus on getting the best economics of the vessel and fleet management. And when they update any of the values, 
the system is always looking for another savings opportunity based on the latest economic parameters, as well as the changing weather. So anytime the weather changes, we're always looking for that opportunity. And if the captain and the crew and the shoreside team decide to accept uh, a new routing change or speed profile, they hit the follow button. And once they've hit that follow button, they're provided with an ECTIS file that they import directly onto the um, ECTIS on the, on the bridge computer, import the waypoints, adjust their RPMs. These ECTIS files that we provide um, have been vetted to make sure that they're navigable routes. So we have an ENC on the back end of our system that is making sure that these are compliant um, with navigation standards. And then very quickly, I'll talk about something that's wholly unique um, and really interesting. I think the industry is aware that the ocean as a whole is becoming more energetic. Our planet is warming. And as a result, the seas are warming. And because the seas are warmer, um, we've got more energy in the ocean. And we've seen over the last you know, just half decade, an increase in the number of incidents with cargo losses and damage to cargo, especially um, on the LNG and, 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 and uh, container side. One of the things that's unique, I think, about our spotter buoys is that they measure full spectra. So as opposed to just measuring the bulk wave statistics, which is purely what is the significant wave height at any given point and the direction, we understand that the waves are made up of multiple different wave fields and we're able to measure each individual parameter of each individual wave field. We have that breakdown, which is incredibly important um, for understanding how the vessel is going to roll or behave um, or respond in different sea states. So we're, we're able to predict much more accurately whether there's going to be parametric or synchronous, synchronous rolling um, events and alert the captain uh, along their route and via email in the app as well um, to those events so they can make the right decisions. So this is incredibly important. Again, we have the most detailed full spectra, full wave spectra data. And we are the only company as far as we know that's, that's collecting that data and then directly translating it into sea keeping alerts uh, in this way. Most other folks are just using the bulk statistics. So really important differentiator uh, and very, very powerful. Yeah, again, a key key differentiator when it comes to the container line market too, where there's a lot of uh, applications of this. Really quickly going into the My Digital Fleet uh, experience, which is really what the shore side team sees. So it mirrors a lot of what the Wayfinder application does on board the vessel, but think of the experience being on the shore side team, not just about the situation around awareness around that single vessel, but it's about the overall fleet and how all the vessels are performing. And you will be able to go in and look at a single vessel in this instance, as you can see on the screenshot a bit on the white there, and actually see the total consumption of fuel. You'll be able to see its carbon footprint, its commercial performance. How are the different influencing factors, both technical and commercial, contributing towards your excess consumption and how do you how is the constraints really working against that and you can break this down both at a leg level you can look at waypoint specific information you can also roll it all up to a voyage and then further up to a fleet level view all of those give you the different uh, ways in which you want to analyze this to see what's the best solution from a decarbonization standpoint and i think the vessel performance is is a really key component there as the very custom vessel specific model that's been built and seeing the impact, not just from a technical standpoint of a fouling perspective, but also what we bring to the table from a My Digital Fleet standpoint is your fuel penalties based on the excess consumption that you're seeing. And commercially, how does that impact? So you can make those, let's say maintenance triggers to see at what point of time do you want to take the vessel out of service and, and do that health cleaning given the impact to your operations from a savings standpoint. 
as a whole, some of the key capabilities that, that come together here is really about that unified platform. So as Sheik mentioned, the noon reports, whether it's coming in as a low, low frequency noon report format or high frequency sensor information, all of that information using some of the core capabilities of my digital fleet comes together. We have a standardized data model that helps with all the ingestion and the pre-processing and post-processing that's required to make sure that we clean the data, extrapolate any of the information that's required and have a right quality of data that's required to provide those critical insights regarding your voyage optimization and decarbonization goals. And along with that, um, you also get to see more of a connected view of your overall fleet's asset risk profile. So think of this as being your everyday morning when you're having your operations meetings, you want to come in and look at a screen and you're able to see in a very quick view all the vessels in your fleet and a red, amber, green indication of these vessels to know that which vessels from your fleet attention need attention today and why. And the different factors that go in are all kind of listed here from an environmental, structural, machinery, and operation side. And this all comes together so you can make those critical decisions more proactively very quickly there. Well, we're and coming to the end now. We are yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So with that, we'll, we can definitely move into the questions. Thanks, Carl, and the rest of the group for some of your patients. Just wanted to walk through the story so you get the full full picture. Okay, well, that's great. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to the questions. So I'd like to invite everyone to open the Q&A box. So I've just discovered you have to filter the questions in order of most upvotes rather than most recent. So we get the ones with the most upvotes, go to the top of the list. I'm not sure we're going to have time to answer all of these, but we'll, we'll try. Um, so you should see George Strompoulis at the top of your list and Demi Kaloga if you're ordered by both upvotes. I think we've got about one minute for each question. So perhaps we'll skip over the ones that uh, I think the answers will be too long. And uh, OK, so if we start with uh, George Strompoulis, so he, he's asking how many days ahead do you predict the weather? Um, do you want to take that one, Sheik? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we use a, a global forecast model um, that applies different weighted um, statistics and um, potential realization factors to each day and it reduces going forward. So um, typically within our optimization, we're considering, I would say six days out, it is the most we're considering for the actual optimization within the application and within um, the emails that go to the captain crew and, and shoreside team, we're pre predicting 10 days out, but it's usually the, the first six days that, that have the biggest impact on the actual optimization algorithm. Okay, and Sheik, do you want to take Ian Paul's question? How does it measure wind speed? Is that the surface level wind speed? Well, no height, so I guess you can't. Uh... It, it, it is the surface level wind speed. Um, and basically we're looking at the, the scintillation of the surface of, of the ocean. We're able to control for, for the wave motion. And so it's a derivative uh, measurement, proxy measurement, but it's, it's been shown to be, you know, as accurate as what you're measuring with satellites. Okay, so two questions for Smarty now. So Demi Kaloga from National Technical University of Athens, I would like to learn more about the optimization algorithm. That sounds like more than a one minute answer, but uh, George Strompoulis from Prime Marine in Athens is asking, how do you consider hull and propeller fouling as part of your model? I don't know if you can answer that in a minute. Can you? <laughs> we can give the short and easy version. Definitely okay. look forward to have a longer conversation on that. So we have a we have a vessel performance model that can be customized based on, as Sheik mentioned, the two years of data that's brought in, whether it's high frequency or uh, it's a noon report. And we optimize the model to be able to look at more dynamically. As the vessel is navigating, we continuously update these models and we represent a true true view of the contribution to both hull and propeller fouling. That's that's essentially the case. But yeah, it's a it's a deep technical discussion for sure. Okay. Yeah, we, we can also see outliers, right? If if we can see the performance sure. drifting and, and if we see the performance degrading versus the expected performance okay. model. That's usually a pretty good indicator. I think within the My Digital Fleet system, you'd be able to alert um, as to, you know, there, there could be a fouling issue. This vessel might need some, some cleaning and servicing. 
Okay, so we've got three questions up, boys, now. So Alex Albertini from Marfin Management in Monaco, um, Martin Shields in Aberdeen, and Vikram and Joshi. So how do you guarantee your boys are in the optimum position? How do you integrate boy data into the forecast model? And who installs the boys? You want to take all those, Shi? Yeah, so I think a couple of these we can collapse into to one question. So in the open ocean, uh, these buoys are free drifting. And the drifting of the buoys is actually very important for us to correct the surface currents. We wanna have a very accurate characterization of the surface currents and the drift patterns are really important for that. For, for that. So we have a team of ocean scientists that you know, recommends to our deployment partners, many of which are our existing shipping company customers, um, you know, where they should be deploying these things in, in order to maintain some optimal coverage. So, that, that's kind of how we do it. And so they're drifting around and that's really important, that data as well. The, and then the, the question I guess is, is, uh, is the data generated from it for free? How much does it cost? We actually, you know, the, the data from our buoys and, and our entire data infrastructure, we make it for free to the research community. So education and academic purposes, um, and scientists around the world, we, we do charge for the data um, typically, but for Wayfinder, it's free in that it's, it's a part of the service. Um, this is something that's super valuable, I think, for the master and the crew. They're able to, within the Wayfinder app, click on a buoy um, and get the actual sea state as it was observational sea state as it was last reported. This gives them a lot more confidence in the forecast allows them another data point to validate the forecast as well as the routing instructions. And I, I would just add, we also provide buoys free of cost to our, our customers as a part of this partnership. Um, a lot of, some of our customers may be operating in areas where we don't have strong buoy coverage. And so you're, you know, as, you're, or as your ships are, are transiting those strategic routes, your crew can drop the buoys in the water that those buoys become, you know, on the spotter buoys go online immediately, start transmitting data and provide that data to not only to the global forecast model, but to the captain and crew so that um, we can improve their optimizations. Okay, so um, Sheik, do you want to take those two more questions about the buoys? Yanis Gavrilis is asking, how do you collect the data? What frequency? And Anna Hita Lavarak is asking, what's their lifetime? And we already talked about drifting out useful range. Do you want to take those two? Yeah, so, um, they're, they're sampling constantly, um, and then they report what's collected every hour. So every hour they transmit through the Iridium satellite network, and it instantly becomes available to our forecast models. Um, and then uh, useful lifetime, you know, we anticipated that we would get about two years um, out of each one, but our first buoy that was ever deployed, which we call Grandpa Spotter, is still floating around in the Pacific and reporting uh, data. Um, we, we do beach buoys from time to time, they'll wash ashore, but we have a really effective program for that. Basically, when they wash ashore, we know exactly where they are. We, we either contact um, some of our customers who are local to that area or folks in, in the local coastal community where they've washed ashore. And we offer those buoys to them to, to essentially moor off of their local coastline and provide data to the community free of cost. So it's a really nice kind of symbiotic win-win program there. Okay, so, so Smarty, I think there's uh, three software questions coming up next. So uh, Rene Lin, who I think works for a marine data company in Hong Kong is asking, do you have an API interface? Um, Vikran Joshi is saying, do I have to buy this uh, software from ABS? I don't think you'd have to buy any hardware. Um, Yahiela Kala is asking, is it a, uh, Touch screen friendly and SK Pal is asking, does it integrate into electronic charts? Do you want to maybe take all those quick ones? Yeah, sure. So uh, if I can remember all of them in the sequence. Yeah, so be on the screen. The... <laughs> <laughs> so on, on the electronic charts, for sure, we, we have a partnership that, that brings in the electronic navigation charts. You'll be able to look at that and make sure the, the voyages are, uh, are safe before you accept the routes. We do have an API option that, that can be used to be able to integrate in, whether it's in the data ingestion piece or consuming it externally. 
we can definitely expose uh, capabilities there to be able to make sure that that's available. Yeah. And, and then you have to buy the hardware and software from ABS, yes, I imagine you do. There, yes, that, 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 would be, that would be part of the effort. I, I think it, uh, yeah, go ahead, Chief. There, there's no hardware install involved though, yeah. right? There, there's zero cap. Just the effect. software. Yeah. So I would say, you know, Shoreside, it's as simple as opening your web browser and accessing the, uh, accessing the application, both my digital fleet as well as uh, the SoFar Wayfinder app. And then it's the same thing for Wayfinder on the actual vessel. They just access it through the browser and whitelist. There's nothing installed, no hardware install required. As long as you have a VSAT connection, it should be good. Well, are you both free for another 10 minutes, maybe, to try and answer some of these questions? Is that OK? Of course, yeah. OK. Yeah. Okay, so I saw two questions about loading here. Maybe I'm um, smart. You want to take these? And Michael Trent is saying the loading and ballast conditions are going to change the sea keeping characteristics of the ship. I don't know about a captain requesting a ship motion within desired safety limits. I guess it's something else in the model. Um, yeah, Karen. that would be part of. Yeah, so that would be something that we would uh, we would be able to ingest in in real time in terms of both the loading conditions and and making sure that we are getting the safe constraints as ABS. As we have done the design reviews and stability and sea keeping performance checks, there are certain constraints both from an IMO standard as well as from the ABS envelope in terms of safe operating limits. That's already put in as constraints. And as she kind of mentioned about all the sea keeping guidance that you get, they are making sure that the alerts that we receive are within those ranges that has been predefined. And we would get some of those loading conditions and so that uh, all of this is kind of in real time giving you the best guidance you can. Oh, okay. So Shik, so there's about three questions about weather forecasting. Arvin is asking, how's the data differed to that from NOAA? I guess they don't have boys, of us, I'm guessing. Um, SK Powell from Hempel, he's got a three letter acronym I've never seen before, ODAs. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Um, what's different? Um, Vikran Joshi is asking, does your network run from Southeast Asia to the Arctic Sea? Should we try to take all those three? Yeah, so, uh, first one, how is your data different from what's collected from NOAA? It, it's different in a few ways. So, so NOAA does have buoy programs. Primarily, they're focused on coastal areas because it's part of the U.S. Department of Con Commerce. They have drifter programs in the open ocean, but none of those drifters uh, or very, very few of those drifters actually collect wave data, which is really an important you know, resistance factor for ships. Um, we use NOAA data. We use lots of NOAA satellite data. The difference is that we constrain all of the different satellite data sources that we get using the real ground truth observations from our spotter buoy network. Um, there's a question about how do winds affect buoy drift and thus a direct relationship with surface currents. I, I think I've answered that one already, but you know, there, there is a windage associated with the buoy drift, and we, we understand what that windage is. So we just discount the drift by a certain percentage because we, we know what the, the, the winds are in a, in a specific area. So we're able to discount that, and, and that's how we, we arrive at the drift characterization and, and correction to the currents. And then uh, I think SKS, ODAS is already existing. ODAS, I think, is Ocean Data as a Service, I believe. Um, so what is different? Uh, I think, you know, I think again, the difference is that we have, oh, ocean, ocean data acquisition systems, <laughs> ocean data acquisition systems. I'm actually not familiar with that acronym. Um, I, I, I'm familiar with ocean data as a service, which is O D A A S. Um, so I, I would love to take that question offline and learn more about it from you, SK pal. And then uh, do you have buoy network from Southeast Asia to Arctic Sea? Yes, we have lots in Southeast Asia. Um, in the Arctic, we have quite a few and are adding more. We've started working with, with a few shipping companies that are operating in that area and they're dropping sensors. We also have a lot of research partners who operate in the, in the Arctic, um, both from, from the country of Japan, as well as the United States and Russia. And all of them are also dropping uh, sensors in the Arctic region. Okay, so smart. You've got three software questions coming up. So where is it deciding on the best uh, course? Is it calculating on board or is it calculated remotely? 
Um, Richard Smale is asking how much data does it upload? And I think there was a, another software question, but it's gone down the list. Would you want to take those two first? Oh, yeah, does it, so oh you typed it. Is it, you need to be ABS class. That's the other one. Moving. Yeah, that, because, that one I yeah. kind of answered. Uh, but the one in terms of the route optimization sort of happens in the cloud, let's say it's, it's happening with the data coming in and it's being fed to both the vessel as well as through the uh, through my digital fleet on the shore side. The guidance is also received by email. So you get it in an ECTIS compliant file. So you can just take that file at the bridge and, and plug it in and make sure that you, you check the routes on the ECTIS and accept it. Once it, it's accepted, it's, it's an active route and live on both the shore side view and as well as on the shipboard. So that's how we would address it. Oh, so uh, going back to boys' questions or Jonathan's, how far does the forecast go? I think you said that was up to six days. Um, Arvin is asking about power supply issues. What's the percentage? I don't know what percentage of what does he mean? Um, Ian Paul is asking what happens at the end of their life? Are you going <laughs> to create more ocean debris? <laughs> don't say try those three. Yeah, you know, I, I can talk about power. You know, there's solar powered and um, highly efficient solar panels that come from automotive industry, you know, and we have very efficient processes on board. These things operate even at very high, high latitudes. So Arctic Circle and, you know, in the Southern Ocean and report, you know, very regularly. It, you know, we even have ones that are actually at the poles and, and they'll go to sleep and hibernate during, you know, the Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere winter and then wake up again in the spring. Um, so that's regarding the power. So end of life, I think I talked about this a little bit. You know, the, the biggest problem we have with them is beaching, um, I would say in terms of, of losing sensors from the network. We, they don't, we don't really lose them any other way. Even if a, if a, if a ship hits them, they, they, they're pushed aside by the bow wave. Um, you know, we, we partner with a lot of scientific organizations on the deployment of these sensors. And again, we make it all of the data free to researchers and academics who are using it for very advanced climate studies and looking at, at, at massive global weather systems and improving kind of humanity's use of and sustainable use of the ocean. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a key part of the mission at, at so far is really making, you know, humans use of, of the ocean much more sustainable because it's so important in driving our global both weather and climate systems, and it covers 70% of the, the surface of the planet. At the end of life, you know, again, most of it is beaching, and we have pretty sophisticated ways of, of collecting those beached spotters and then redeploying them in coastal areas so that they can continue to provide data to those coastal communities. Oh, oh, sounds great. So Peter Hatchet-Pateras is asking Smarty about customers. I think you had one slide when you mentioned a couple of names. Is there something, obviously it's not confidentiality, but uh, is there something you're able to share more about that on that question? You think? Yeah, sure. So we uh, don't want to specifically name name all the customers. I think the few that we, we had requested for permission, we kind of listed out there. But we, we definitely do have a number of customers. We have about nine to 10 customers actively running through pilots with us that are using this application it varies as we mentioned from tankers, bulkers, container lines. So there's there's a good good mix of clients who have seen through an ROI at the moment. Okay, I think we're moving on to the sort of tricky, uh, broader questions, which are quite hard to answer in one minute, but maybe I'll, I'll just sort of try to sort of skim through them and see um, if uh, Peter Mantle is asking, I don't think the question on the actual optimization algorithm has been addressed yet. I, I suppose it's an obviously complicated optimization algorithm. I don't think it's a, something we can cover it in a minute or so. Arvind and Sharma is asking how you're combining this with whatever companies already have. I suppose that's also quite hard to answer. Um, Yanis Gavrilis is asking how do we combine with, uh, so far combining with other weather data. So um, not Arvin's question is a pretty easy one to answer. So we, we work with some liner operators where they're not only using our application, but they're also buying the data directly, the weather data, because they use it in their fleet operations center. So, you know, you want to have often multiple sources of data to understand if there's a divergence in the forecast uh, and, you know, make a judgment call as to what the best source of truth is. So that's, that's a pretty simple one. I agree with you. Um, Carl, that uh, the optimization algorithm, much deeper, 
conversation, I think Smarty and I would be happy to arrange a call with our ocean scientists and data science team to go into those technical details um, sure, yeah. if, if that's needed. Yeah. Talk about how, how you're combining your, your data with other sources. So citizen scientists, open source data, or maybe, maybe you don't, so feel free to say. We, we do actually, do, okay. the, the, the Aqualink buoys that Kirk ref, is referencing there, those are actually so far systems. So Aqualink is, is one of the nonprofits conservation organizations that we work with. They've put um, sensors at over 200 coral, sensitive coral reefs around the world to measure um, the health of those reefs and how temperature stratification is impacting bleaching events there. So all of that data is also part of, uh, of our infrastructure and, and goes into Wayfinder. Well, this is an interesting question from uh, Rishi Xavier, who's an assistant technical manager with Masuga, a shipping company in Hong Kong, but he's saying this is for you, Smarty, I think. So if, uh, if charterers want to have their own weather forecast and they want to make all the decisions, so rather than the ship doing it, is this an issue that comes up a lot of I mean that there is this uh, there is a view of making sure that both the charters and the operators are aligned in terms of what the weather conditions are and that's where I think the level of accuracy and high fidelity information that we are talking about and having that shared view across both the charter and the operator comes in handy but charters come up with typically the understanding of what the constraints are and they may have their own voyage or weather providers but typically if we can share what the vessel is experiencing, it, uh, it, that's what goes into the discussion. Oh, that's great. Well, I think we're sort of coming to the end. I think there's been a few questions in the chat. If I can ask people, if you haven't had a question answered, if you could put it in the Q&A box, we won't have time to read it. But uh, so Kyo Ong is asking if you're incorporating hydrodynamic behavior of the ship. I think, Smarty, you said you had specific models of the ship, so, so I, I guess Correct. you are. Um, yeah. Arvind Sharma is saying, how do you measure the Dale to inaccuracy? I suppose that's how the weather forecast is better to, to others. So uh, uh, SK Pal is asking who takes responsibility for the alerts. I suppose the shipping company is fundamentally responsible. I'm guessing and, uh, Greg Hammond is asking about subsurface currents. SK Pal, well, sailor they know since it gets WX data. I don't understand that one, but you want to any, any, uh, <laughs> any comments on this? Do you want to? No, so the sea keeping alerts that, that are uh, coming out, they, they are available to both the, uh, the master on board the vessel who, who ultimately has to make the call. The idea is making sure that we have those constraints in and you're getting those alerts. And if it's being dismissed or accepted, that feedback mechanism is definitely in there for us to capture that information. Um, yeah. Oh. oh, that sounds great. Any more comments, Sheikh, on these last three questions or anything else? Sure. Yeah, I, I would say, um, I, I think I understand well sailor, they know since weather data, I, I'm a sailor, I've, I've done two ocean crossings in a very small uh, 10 meter sailboat. So, you know, I understand what it's like being in the ocean with very little data and have a deep appreciation for this. On the subsurface currents, we do not measure subsurface currents at the moment. Um, that's a very complicated, different thing. Um, we really specialize at the ocean boundary layer. So where the atmosphere meets the ocean, as well as the coasts where, you know, the land meets the ocean, there's other folks who kind of specialize in subsurface currents. It takes much more complicated instrumentation that tends to be more focused on the energy industry. So anyone who's, who's doing construction offshore, um, we're, we're talking to folks about potentially getting better measurements there from, from you know, other sources, but currently we don't have that, the, the you know, below 10 meters, uh, we don't have that data. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, well, I mean, one, one number I wrote down, you mentioned somewhere 3% voyage gains. So I think that's the, that's the most important number for the audience, as long as you can back it up with your trials, which it sounds like you can do. I mean, if companies want to knock a few percent, there's, not many ways, only 3%, that's a big saving on fuel consumption and it's worth taking the effort to understand these technologies and getting it. If you want to get your CII scores down, I suppose that's the most important thing to leave the audience with. I just want to take a couple of minutes each to last words for the audience. That's what I, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think definitely, again, just kind of re-emphasizing the short-term and uh, you know near-term or the interim plans that uh, all of us have. The responsibility is really to look at our 
current fleet understand the vessel specific uh, performance as it relates to your carbon footprint? And, and as Sheik mentioned, what is our low, um, you know, low investment, high gain scenario, which is really about the operational efficiency and, and doing it accurately and, and correctly. It's, it's like, again, there are lots of options, but if you do it the right way and you can actually see the tangible return, which is why that you know, average 3% number is, is really important, that, that makes a huge difference in your operation. So um, I, I, we definitely see together as the starting point for any decarbonization journey is really monitoring and optimizing your voyage. Oh, fantastic. Sheik, another two minutes to the last words. Yeah, I would say, you know, for us, the first priority is always safety, um, right? Of, of the crew, cargo, um, and, and the vessel. And so that that's kind of, that trumps everything else. It's about how can you get the ship from port A to port B as safely as possible? And then understanding what are the risk tolerances, um, and, and, you know, really finding that balance between those two. And I think you're going to see the uncertainty in the ocean increase as it becomes more energetic. And so being able to accurately forecast is going to become more and more important over the next decade. And, you know, it's, it's an easy thing to test. It's, it's an easy thing to get a sense of, hey, will this work for a sample size of my fleet? For my trade routes, as Smarty mentioned, you know zero capex. Like, wh why wouldn't you try it? Um, you know, it's it's just a small time investment. And so, most of the folks who who try this system immediately see how different it is. You know, the shift from reactive routing to proactive voyage optimization is 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 pretty big. And you know. There's a small amount of change management associated with it, but the the upside is well worth it, we think. And there's oh, a fun. lot of activity that's gone in again, just from a customer experience for both the folks on both the vessel as well as the shore side, a lot of effort having developed this in conjunction with clients that really minimizes that barrier to adoption that folks are seeing things that they're familiar with and can understand intuitively. It's not meant to be a black box. It's not intended to be something that's very difficult for folks to interpret and make decisions on. It's really helping augment what you know around your vessel and make quick decisions you know, very intuitively. Uh, absolutely. You're, you're, that's a great point that I don't think we hit enough, Smarty. It's that you know, there's one part of this, which is a math problem, which is trying to find the, the, the most the, the least cost um, safest route based on changing conditions and parameters. And then the second part is, you know, you have a captain and crew at sea who are in a, an environment far from shore <laughs> trying to make decisions based on, you know, information that they have and they want the best information and they, they want to, they want real observations. They want to trust their forecast um, and they just want to get their vessel and their cargo safely into port, right? Um, they want to minimize time on the water. It, the, the incentives are very aligned there between the captain and the, the operators and charterers. Everyone wants minimum time on the water, which, you know, is really about avoiding resistance and avoiding storms. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Well, I guess we'll, we'll finish there. I think this is amazing. I think from my perspective, there's not many times you hear about new technologies that get this 3% uh, bar. I think that's a line that people can start taking these things seriously. So you must be absolutely exhausted. And Sheikh, I know you've got a whole day ahead of you in San Francisco. And I'm back to home. But I shall, I shall pass on to uh, Neff for the closing words. Thank you. Uh, so we just had a very lively conversation with Smarty, Matthew, John, and Sheikh Sandar about the new venture, um, the ABS and so far Ocean My Digital Fleet. Um, thank you for your time and your input and also thank you to our viewers for all their interesting <laughs> questions. Um, before I sign off, I'd just like to mention that we hold webinars regularly and stay updated um, by checking our LinkedIn profile or our website for updates. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a good day. Oh, bye-bye. Thanks again for having us. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>